Thank you for joining us today from the PCPCC, bringing you what looks like it's going to be a very interesting presentation on health information technology in the medical home. Uh, this is Donna Lickey of Pfizer, and joining me today and helping me moderate this session is Chris Norton, Executive Director of the eHealth Center, and David Nace, Co-Chair of the eHealth Center. Both that center and the Center to Promote Public Payer Implementation are both sponsoring this session today. We're bringing to you today Dr. Anil Adnani, a physician informaticist who's a federal leader in applying health information technology to improve public health and population medicine. Dr. Adnani is currently detailed to the Indian Health Service as an Associate Director for Informatics in the Office of Information Technology. His responsibilities include overseeing informatics efforts and executive management at the agency, including the population and medical home health IT portfolio with efforts in quality improvement and measurement and meaningful use. So we're very happy to have Dr. Adbani join us today. The presentation is also coordinated with Dr. Howard Hayes, who is commissioned also with 21 years of experience in Indian Health Services and currently is now the Chief Information Officer for the Indian Health Services overseeing information technology. Unfortunately, he's unable to join the presentation today and sends his regrets, but he's in transit. Just a few pieces of information before we start. We want to make sure that all of you are aware of the technology and begin to use the chat uh, windows on your computers to ask questions. You can ask questions throughout the, the entire presentation. And Chris and David and myself will uh, ask Dr. Advani those questions as we move through the presentation, but most likely we'll be holding most of them for the end Q&A session. And lastly, I just wanted to remind everyone of the upcoming conference, the fifth annual summit for PCPCC. If you haven't already enrolled, you can go on to the PCPCC website and register. The meeting is going to be held October 21st, and it looks like a great lineup of sessions for that meeting. And without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce Dr. Anil Edvan. Uh, thanks so much, Donna. Um, can you just uh, confirm, is, can everybody hear me reasonably clearly? Okay, great. Um, so uh, good uh, afternoon, I guess, uh, or morning, depending on the time zone you're in, um, uh, everybody. Uh, and uh, it's a pleasure to be able to talk about um, uh, an area which is of uh, incredible importance, uh, interest, and excitement here at the Indian Health Service, um, uh, which is one of the 10 operating divisions of the Department of Health and Human Services and is uh, actually the main uh, clinical uh, kind of service agency uh, with direct care at uh, HHS. Um, so let's see here now. I think I can do this myself, right? Connected. Go to the next slide here. Great. So uh, uh, this morning, I'm sort of going to talk about the Indian Health Service, um, uh, the context, history, and the population health model. And you know, uh, in the, in that sort of uh, section, really make the point that um, a lot of the incentives uh, that are now kind of part of the environment for the healthcare system in the United States uh, or in Western countries in general. Um, and, and specifically because of health reform, um, are uh, in the same direction uh, that uh, the IHS actually has been facing for you know over 50 years, if not 100 years. So, actually, uh, this is the time really for the Indian Health Service um, to show the way in many in many, uh, in many um, uh, ways for uh, the way a health system can function under health reform. And so uh, actually um, uh, it's great to be able to sort of present that uh, at this point in time. Um, and then I'll describe a little bit about our Improving Patient Care Program, which is sort of the internal name uh, for our patient medical home uh, deployment here at IHS. Uh, and then I'll go on uh, you know, at the level of screenshots to uh, describe some of our health information technology um, efforts to facilitate the patient-centered medical home and population health in general, uh, and then uh, you know we can uh, have a discussion. So 
So that's sort of the agenda, and it's uh, basically I think a third, a third, a third between those sections. So, um, so to start with, uh, really this is one of our sort of you know obligatory introduction slides, uh, but it sort of uh, actually has a lot of information that gives you a very quick snapshot of what the IHS is about. Um, uh, you know, we are a national health system within the federal government that is there to serve the American Indian and Alaskan Native population uh, by treaty obligation, actually, um, uh, in return for uh, sort of uh, two centuries of uh, uh, treaties between um, the sort of independent uh, 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 governments that, of the tribal governments that retain um, uh, uh, you know, sovereignty uh, through treaties with the uh, federal uh, United States and its predecessors. Um, and so in return for, as part of those treaty obligations, uh, the U.S. government uh, in, in joins a, um, a trust obligation to, um, uh, uh, to provide uh, health care and uh, protection of um, the persons of uh, Indian health, uh, American Indians and Alaskan Natives. And so there's a lot of implications of that sort of uh, legally uh, and in terms of the framework of government to government relations, which you know, we won't go into. But, um, but it sort of starts at sort of a, a level of, um, of uh, a mandate that is sort of at the very core of our, of our republic. Um, and uh, so uh, the Alaskan, uh, American Indian Alaskan Native, we sort of refer to that in short as Indian country. It's about 5% of the land area of the United States. Um, and as you can see, uh, because of past policies, you know, uh, there's a footprint uh, in Indian reservations. Um, and you can see that uh, some areas uh, are, in fact, kind of uh, uh, pan-state uh, type of uh, service er areas. And that includes Alaska, areas of Arizona, um, and uh, the Oklahoma area. Um, where the uh, proximity to reservations is, isn't as much of a uh, limitation. Um, and as long as you're in the state, actually, there's sort of enough of a footprint to access all services. Um, and then on the reservation side, you can see the Navajo Reservation, sort of very, very large area, the Four Corners area of the United States, uh, which is as big as sort of many states. Um, and then on the, in the East Coast, as you can see, because of territorial expansion, there's sort of smaller footprints and uh, sort of, um, but uh, you know, a retention of on the ground uh, access to clinical services uh, even in that part of the United States. Um, so let's see. Then let me go on to the next slide here. Um, and you know, in order to really understand IHS, uh, one has to sort of remember the uh, roots of this relationship. Um, and uh, sort of I call that the continental geocultural history of uh, American Indians and Alaskan Natives. Um, and it's uh, probably the shortest way to encapsulate uh, 250 years is just to look at sort of title uh, names of the U.S. agencies that um, had engagement with um, uh, American Indians and Alaskan Natives over the last 150 years or so. Uh, and you can kind of quickly get a sense of uh, the history. And so in the 19th century, actually, the engagement uh, came under the auspices of the Department of War. Um, and then around the turn of this century, 1910 or so, it became the Bureau of Indian Affairs as part of the Department of Interior, which used to be called the Department of War. Um, and then in the 1950s, um, because of uh, sort of uh, additional push to really improve uh, health outcomes, uh, the uh, Health Bureau, as part of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, was transferred to the Public Health Service uh, and then called the sort of Indian Health Service as a component of the Public Health Service uh, throughout uh, starting in the 1950s. Um, and then about 20 years ago, uh, the Public Health Service sort of reformed, became more of a staffing component of HHS, and IHS became a uh, operating component of the, uh, of the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, currently led by our director, Dr. Yvette Burrito. Um, and then again in the 1970s, uh, there was uh, a very important change in policy from service through the public health service to a uh, 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 program uh, goal of tribal self-governance with government-to-government relationships 
um, and where uh, we, uh, in consultation with the tribes, sort of uh, look at the responsibilities and functions, and the tribes sort of um, assign those back to us in the federal sector that they could, that they are within their uh, uh, treaty rights to um, uh, adopt themselves. So in a sense, we now are very sensitive to our tribal uh, customers, actually, um, as an agency. So in some sense, uh, IHS is like a private healthcare system in the sense that you know, we have constituents and we really have to, um, um, although we're kind of uh, underwritten by appropriations from Congress, uh, those uh, uh, roles that we play include being a sort of multi-state healthcare system. And so let me go on to the next slide here. Um, and so actually before I describe the healthcare system, the important point here from uh, this historical perspective is in fact, there's always been a context of uh, incredibly low resources. So the federal government spends less per capita on Native American health care than on any other group for which it has responsibility, including Medicaid recipients, prisoners, veterans, and military personnel. Um, and so actually, in some sense, the IHS has been forced to do a lot with very little for many, many years. Um, and uh, I will be uh, showing in a few slides the sort of effect of that the challenges that we face um, and the sort of uh, uh, organizational and philosophical perspective of our health system. Um, but b before I go into that, uh, the footprint for us uh, in terms of the Alaska Indian, uh, I mean American Indian Alaska Native population in Indian country is, uh, now this is from six years ago, it's about one and a half to two million active users. We call that our user population, which is basically the denominators uh, in our national data warehouse. Um, and so those are people who have active medical records and actually seek care on a periodic basis. Um, and that's about half of the total sort of census count version of uh, um, uh, American Indian, Alaskan Native uh, citizens uh, in our country. Um, um, so uh, it doesn't serve sort of everybody, especially those who are sort of veterans and uh, you know are able to afford private healthcare in the more urbanized areas and have assimilated. Um, our footprint tends to be around sort of the core areas of uh, this regional population here. Okay, so um, here's a slide on service growth. So. A part of this is uh, measurement bias because of the way the census now allows you to self-identify your sort of sub-ethnic components and multiple ethnicities. Uh, but a lot, uh, but a sort of legitimate component of this is actual true population growth. Um, and so, um, you know, we actually have experienced uh, a quite a high growth rate compared to the rest of the uh, uh, country. Uh, at the level of sort of the average, um, well, anyway, so about 1.8% per year. Um, you know, we have uh, health indicators and social indicators, as you can see, uh, that uh, provide us with challenges um, and need to be understood in the sort of historical context of the relationship between uh, Indian country and uh, the rest of the United States. Um, uh, okay, so. Let's see here. So uh, I was talking to you about the Indian Self-Determination Act. Um, and so it's a complicated uh, relationship. Um, you know, uh, doing health IT with this population uh, is, a, uh, is a complex exercise um, because we have jurisdictional issues. Uh, uh, we have negotiations, uh, consultations. Uh, there's division of responsibilities. Um, and we at IHS have many hats that you might find uh, that we wear that sort of are there for sort of multiple different entities in the private sector. So we are a clinical service entity. We have hospitals, federal hospitals, uh, health centers, health stations. Um, we are a staffing agency. We uh, are a payer. Uh, we contract out care uh, more for specialist care. We are a regulatory agency. Uh, you know, we develop uh, clinical policies. We are a public health agency. We actually have a national level sort of public health presence uh, and organization uh, that deals with public health. 
we are a reporting agency. Um, and so actually, um, you know, under health reform where you have accountable care organizations that are risk-bearing entities and reporting entities um, and regulatory entities actually, um, IHS has sort of been there, done that for about 40 years. And so you'll see what that implies for how we organize our care model, how we develop HIT, what the HIT is that we have, and the relationship between all three of those. Um, and then superimposed on that is this tribal self-determination, government to government, and a division of responsibility. Um, so let's see here. Um, so I talked about challenges. Um, so here's um, a slide uh, which uh, is data from 1997, but basically is not uh, too different from what you would see in 2010 in terms of relative risk. Uh, so this is uh, Alaska Native American Native mortality versus uh, all races in the U.S. Um, so you can see, uh, you know, accidents, diseases of the young, diseases of uh, lack of, uh, of physical infrastructure at the reservations, um, and then special uh, elements of uh, disease burden related to behavior um, uh, and uh, other determinants of health that translate into end result um, disease burden here. So. Um, you know, diabetes, heart disease uh, are actually both higher, and diabetes especially. Um, cancer, sort of disease of longevity are transitioning now with a demographic transition that is taking place in Indian country to uh, more closely approximate that uh, which you see in the general U.S. population. But the demographic transition is sort of starting now, and over the next 20 years, you know, geriatric medicine will start becoming much more important. Um, but because of this, uh, we actually have a separate diabetes program separately appropriated by Congress. Um, so let me go on to the next slide here and show the, lose the oh. okay. So uh, so challenges with uh, with this. So you know, uh, access to care, expectations of the community, socioeconomic status, literacy, access to information, geography, tremendous implications for broadband access, uh, the way we architect our entire national footprint of uh, HIT, uh, you know, uh, compared to the way, let's say, the VA does it, um, uh, transportation to uh, an actual clinic visit can take many hours, and that changes what you encapsulate in an actual visit um, and the model of care. Um, substance abuse, you know, behavioral issues, historical alcoholism, um, and then this idea of, uh, you know, environmental uh, uh, accidents, etc. So that means the IHS uh, consciously in the 50s as part of the public health service when uh, in, in the sort of last decade in which uh, public health, regional health officers, and clinical medicine uh, from the public sector predated the rise of the Great Society programs and really were the engines of, um, uh, of uh, community health, we retained that as a model from the 1950s, uh, which the public health service lost uh, starting with uh, you know, the rise of federal insurance. And so we have a very broad picture of health, and really uh, it's the entire community that is the patient. And that comes across in terms of the way the agency is organized um, and uh, the elements of care that we integrate uh, very directly, so which includes you know, personal individual health care, family health, public health, population health, this idea of self-governance, the implications for the kind of data and how we can cross-map data. Um, uh, sharing of uh, demographics, the government-to-government implications for uh, measuring different denominators across tribes, uh, lack of uh, I mean, consultation required to share information from one tribe to a national aggregate that can be you know, fed back uh, to sister tribes. Um, environmental data, uh, and uh, you know, at IHS there's a whole division of environmental health, and you know, we're still building up uh, basic infrastructure um, for uh, in collaboration with the uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs for our uh, for the tribe um, and uh, so uh, it's a broad national 
kind of view of healthcare, and some of the elements of health reform actually kind of are targeting that picture now uh, with a pendulum swinging back. Um, uh, so I have a few slides to sort of illustrate uh, how that takes place and the um, conceptual justification for um, you know treating the population as a patient. Um, and I used to be at the CDC before coming to IHS, uh, and uh, so this is sort of an important perspective that I find uh, to um, my delight is actually still part of our healthcare system here. So here's the uh, trend in, uh, in diabetes burden between the general population and uh, American Indian Alaska Native. So you can see actually it's not a problem that's going away, it's actually a problem that's getting more acute. Um, I don't think this is age adjusted, but uh, I think it's still sort of very valid. Oh, it was age adjusted, uh, so it's actually a very real signal here. You're seeing. Um, so here's uh, a, uh, a slide from a paper in JAMA by uh, Greg and Albright, who are part of the Division of Diabetes Translation at CDC uh, in 2009. And what you see here is. Um, uh, based on sort of uh, national diabetes surveillance system, which actually does not have role level data. It's uh, reports from the states up to the CDC and sort of the traditional national surveillance model. And what you see here is in column A, uh, there's a trend of uh, end stage uh, uh, sequelae of diabetes um, in persons with diagnosed diabetes in the denominator. So you can see here, for those people who have diagnosed diabetes, actually you know, amputation is going down, end stage renal disease is going down. So our trials for, you know, tightly controlling diabetes over the last, um, uh, this is 15 years uh, from 1990 to 2005, uh, when, you know, close management of diabetes was sort of the signal um, uh, uh, mechanism to for control is actually, you know, very successful, uh, as well as including mortality from hypoglycemia, um, from hyperglycemia. But if you look at the total population, uh, you know, you saw that increase uh, in the American Indian uh, population. There was a slight upward trend in the U.S. population as well. If you look there, and you look at the same sequelae, actually, you do have a decrease in mortality, but the sequelae and the disease burden, uh, it's not really in the same direction. End-stage renal disease is going up, and uh, amputations are, you know, they've gone up and up and then back down a bit, but they're still sort of, they're not below where we used to be. Um, and so what's the difference between those two pictures? And the difference is, in one case, in A, you're plotting uh, people who have already been diagnosed, so you're really talking about tertiary treatment and secondary prevention. Whereas in B, you're talking about the sort of general prevalence, which includes uh, increase in your denominator. So if the number of people with diabetes have been going up, actually the absolute uh, risk from uh, all these sequelae are also going up. So there's sort of two different pictures of the difference between the perspective of a health system that treats the community as a patient uh, versus uh, the perspective that treats an individual as a patient. In one case, you may be very successful, but you're actually sort of not that successful, uh, and you still have a very sick community out there. Um, and that's really the perspective difference between a sort of national health care system and your individual clinical physician. Um, so just to sort of bear home that point a little bit more with three or four more slides. Um, and, and what are the implications of that idea of denominator? So, so one of the implications is, um, you know, behavior matters. Uh, and so you can see the sort of uh, similar relative risk, uh, age-adjusted relative risk data from uh, 15 years late, 1997 to 2003, which actually this is the most recent published data that I can quote. We're preparing the 2010 version of this. Um, and so you see, you know, TB, chronic liver disease, diabetes, uh, uh, there are still risks. Um, and this isn't absolute prevalence, but, or absolute incidence. It's relative risk, uh, so it's not the same slide as the sort of order of mortality. But, uh, but you can see the behavioral diseases and environmental diseases are still very uh, important. And obviously chronic liver disease and cirrhosis is related to alcoholism. Um, Okay, so here's uh, another perspective. Um, so this is from PLOS uh, Medicine, a study by Azati, and it's uh, uh, 
uh, contributory all-cause mortality at two different time intervals. So it's basically plotting uh, for each age group, male and female, the different um, uh, uh, relative risks uh, and changes uh, in the probability of death from periods before um, with respect to sort of different types of conditions. So basically, how do we die at different age groups? And you can see from the top row to the bottom row, the colors are changing. The components of those, uh, uh, of those um, bars here are actually made up of different diseases between the uh, period uh, of 1961 to 83 and the changes that took place in 1983 to 1999. So it's really a change in the rate of growth. And so, and so you can kind of see the change of the behavior of our disease burden in different segments of the population, ages and, and, and sexes. And what you see here is, you know, this makes the point that we are all mortal, we all die, but as a community, the community changes the sicknesses from which it uh, suffers. And so even though we may be sort of very successful for an individual person to compress their morbidity, um, to uh, which you can sort of see here as well over the sort of difference in the two 15 year period, um, uh, even though we might be successful with particular individuals, you know, the denominators are non-monotonic. So it's not just all, uh, you know, uh, a good story in one direction when you use the community as a, uh, as a denominator. There's always going to be national level challenges, you know, medicine will always be necessary. Um, and so, so uh, really the sort of, um, chameleon-like behavior of a community when you sort of have a national healthcare system, um, you know, continues to produce challenges from the point of view of evolving the clinical model. And so this is the sort of point to make here. And I, I thought this slide sort of just encapsulates that story, you know, with some real data very, very well. Okay, so let's change gears a little bit, I think. So, and I may have made these points already, so, and I don't know why I've got this uh, animated, but uh, and so when we think about denominators, uh, you know, I talked about that sort of prevention-oriented aspect of them. I talked about behavioral change, sociocultural context, and equity. Um, and so really health information technology for system change is really what drives the reason you have HIT for a national healthcare system. And you need that system change constantly because the community changes uh, as the sort of chameleon-like uh, story uh, uh, you know, or amoeba-like story uh, throughout history. So um, population health informatics is a sort of key driver. And so the uh, elements of the medical home, uh, the elements of sort of new accountable care models um, and population health are really sort of joined at the hip because of this sort of uh, uh, set of con uh, conceptual points that I just made. And a lot of time, even at ONC um, and, you know, our meaningful use regulations, you know, sort of communicating that to the um, interlocutors on the policy committees and standards committees who have that sort of, you know, bread and butter daily practice by a, uh, you know, people who select systems at the hospital enterprise level and really drive the HIT market um, for private sector vendors and, and suppliers, you know, it's, it's actually hard to communicate how important this aspect of uh, health uh, IT is. Uh, when the entire conversation is just about, you know, care transitions from one doctor to the next um, and not taking that global picture. So I, I enjoy the sort of uh, opportunity to sort of make this point because it really is so key. And as we move forward into health reform, that perspective on health IT or health informatics uh, will become more and more important. Um, so, okay. So let's change. Uh, so I've got another sort of uh, slide on this. I think I made this point. Let's get, change gears a little bit um, and talk about population health informatics um, and the elements of it, and then uh, I'll talk uh, about our actual medical home program, and then sort of talk about the relationship between the two in the third part of the talk. So, so we have a sort of full service, uh, uh, you know, population health IT program here at IHS, uh, with starting with you know the sort of top of the the queen of the of the segments here, which is you know to improve our quality, um, and then going on systems to measure uh, clinical and performance reporting, um, you know, make uh, conclusions from the uh, from this reporting in, in terms of clinical repositories uh, for healthcare effectiveness and research, 
and then from that develop clinical policy for care management in a systematic way to actually intervene at the point of care and then epidemiology and surveillance to look at the outcomes of care and the sort of environmental components of uh, those interventions that, that go along with those interventions and then feed that back into inferences about quality improvement. Um, and then uh, sort of in the center is this idea of meaningful use of health IT, um, which if actually, if you look at this picture and look at sort of the components of MU, you will see a lot of stage three in here. You will see the learning healthcare system. You will not see as much directly about stage one. So actually, you know, what IHS has envisioned is already, and I'm sure a lot of your organizations, to really drive healthcare model change which is really what the patient-centered medical home kind of impetus is about, you're really looking at stage two and three, if not stage three. So the story is yet to be told on MU for the purposes of uh, PCMH, and I think you'll sort of that will come out in the rest of the talk. Um, all right, so let's, let's talk a little bit and describe a little bit about our Improving Patient Care uh, program, which is our medical home program. Um, and uh, uh, so let me start with the uh, recent, uh, with the sort of uh, priorities that our director of our agency has uh, uh, challenged us with at the agency to renew and strengthen our partnership with tribes, to bring reform to the Indian Health Service, to improve the quality and access to care, and to ensure that our work is transparent, accountable, fair, and inclusive. Um, and uh, so I think uh, this is supposed to be circling the quality of access to care uh, button rather than reform, but actually it works both ways. Um, so the Improving Patient Care Program, the aim is to change and improve the Indian health system. Uh, the IPC will develop high-performing and innovative healthcare teams to improve the quality and access to care. So uh, this is sort of the encapsulated mission statement for the Improving Patient Care Program. And I have to acknowledge the next few slides in this section uh, are um, borrowed or uh, uh, incorporated with the uh, help of uh, Dr. Lyle Ignace, who is a director, program director of our national IPC uh, program team. Um, okay, so about four years ago, uh, about five uh, years ago, we started with IPC sort of 1.0, uh, so to speak, version one of this um, program. Um, and this program has been developed uh, in close uh, coordination with the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, um, which is the institute at Harvard that John Berwick, uh, who is now the uh, CMS or acting CMS administrator, uh, previously uh, uh, led, uh, started and led. Um, and so, actually, ironically, here's another instance where IHS was sort of looking far ahead. Um, and got a head start on a lot of the sort of initiatives that, and then the sort of philosophical underpinnings of the changes that are now coming out of regulations out of CMS. Um, and so uh, this is sort of, you know, we had sort of 14 initial sites. Uh, our usual early adopters for HIT overlap with these sites uh, very nicely. Um, but it was sort of spread through uh, different categories. So you can see IPC1 was mostly federal sites. Um, but incorporated some of the other uh, tribal and urban sites as well. Um, and then uh, in 2008, uh, so we had IPC2. This was um, uh, uh, 38 sites, and you can see that they've increased. Uh, and uh, this involved sort of a actual evaluation. Um, it the, the spin on sort of this part of the medical home kind of improvement was not as much uh, the chronic care model per se, but just sort of general systems improvement and quality of care change. So we just tried to go whole hog system-wide um, and do everything at once rather than one change at a time. So this is not pay for performance. This is not, you know, specific vertically integrated quality improvement for specific um, uh, vertical lines of service. You know, so this is not the 90s. This is uh, really the late 2000s. Uh, but it was sort of pan um, uh, service change, uh, and uh, because of the successes, plus because of sort of in tremendous ambitions, you know, after a couple of years of this, you know, we really at the agency we had to decide whether we were kind of um, going to uh, go the whole hog, make this our national clinical model, or just um, you know move on. Uh, 
Uh, and, and so there was sort of an inflection point a couple of years ago, and uh, we re <coughs> reinvigorated our leadership. Uh, we uh, reinvigorated uh, the um, you know, engagement of the new sort of director in our administration. And now we actually are uh, uh, sort of fully engaged uh, with a chronic care model medical home underpinning to this system-wide um, uh, improvement program. And so now we have, um, you know, over uh, uh, six, uh, 68 uh, sites in the sort of main part of the program, and we're basically adding 100 sites in the next two years. And just to give you a sense, you know, we have about 465 different physical sites at IHS. Um, we have about 565 uh, or 564 federally recognized tribes, you know, in addition to the state tribes and unrecognized tribes. Um, and then out of those 565, there's sort of 465 physical installations. And then though, out of those, there's about 265 or 235 different physical deployments of our RPMS uh, HIT system. So physical separate servers that have their own medical ID numbers, uh, you know. And so in a sense, we're really a national health system with sort of multiple interrelated uh, subcomponents uh, that are sort of uh, individually operated and run. Um, have their own sort of personal relationships with the tribes that they that they service, and um, so it, you know to add basically 170 to 200 is it, it you know the next two years it's basically the sort of national medical model rollout for the entire healthcare system, um, uh, and you know so that compares to about sort of 550 sort of uh, community health networks or federally qualified community health centers for HRSA. So you know you're talking national level numbers here. Um, Okay, so what do the sites do through this sort of model? Um, uh, th there's sort of uh, major activities uh, at each site include uh, learning sessions, uh, training, uh, you know, uh, impanelment of patients, uh, the identification of leads for uh, each uh, quality goal, and then um, a rapid cyclical improvement methodology. Um, so there's lots of communication, knowledge support, knowledge portal learning. Skill uh, development, and so here's sort of a. I think there's another couple of arrows here. Um, so we've got sort of a foundation series, a collaborative. That's sort of our closed uh, set of tasks to collaborate out to the field. There's a learning network of uh, more advanced um, uh, uh, early adopter subcomponents of this uh, that are rapid innovators. Uh, there's the, uh, you know, uh, instruction support team and then there's sort of national team and an evaluation team evaluation, evaluating all of these, uh, that I'm sort of involved with right here. Um, okay. So, okay. So there's lots there. Okay. All right. So the model for improvement is the sort of plan, do, study, act cycle, uh, that, uh, is sort of a generic term. Um, and so, you know, this is sort of implemented at each site, which we call a microsystem. Um, and, you know, sites can be one or two doctor clinics, uh, two uh, tertiary care hospitals, um, and, but mostly are, you know, about five clinicians or so would be the sort of average uh, that you see. Um, and uh, so that's sort of the sort of picture around taking, um, you know, professional local responsibility for quality improvement. Um, okay, so, uh, so the actual content of the changes and the sort of uh, uh, substantive model underpinning um, the program elements of this uh, is based on the chronic care model from Wagner and adopted by ACP and ASIM in 2003. So it's sort of, uh, you know, very close to underpinning the same models in the medical home. Um, or the initial sort of model of medical home, uh, and that involves, um, you know, all of these elements here, uh, which is health organization, create a culture and organization mechanisms that provide safe, high quality care, community resources, self management support, uh, delivery system design, uh, decision support, and clinical information systems, all there to sort of improve quality. So, uh, you know, this is sort of generic uh, uh, outline of the chronic care model. Um, and so, you know, we have a change package that we create a sort of tool set that involves documentation, training, a sort of re replicable engagement at the site level, as well as the infrastructure creation and the data uh, uh, reporting. Um, 
So uh, what do we measure? Uh, so uh, the sort of outcomes and the indicators we're using for this sort of rapid innovative uh, uh, cycle of improvement include uh, some uh, government performance reporting act type of clinical measures that the agency is held accountable for, uh, chronic condition uh, outcomes. You know, a lot of this is uh, friendly to the clinical quality measures in MU and probably for the next year and the as we converge on our quality reporting systems, we'll uh, involve uh, very closely the quality measures as part of uh, stage two and three. Um, access to care, patient experience, as well as data on uh, cost and efficiency uh, here. And you know, we've got some goals uh, that uh, are not necessarily meaningful in an absolute sense here in terms of describing them, but uh, are sort of important in terms of the embedded nature of this uh, with our uh, numbers in our sort of healthcare system in general. Um, so I do have uh, two slides here of completely anonymous uh, uh, data here just to illustrate the point that uh, give you a sense of the sort of size of our sites uh, and uh, and then sort of how we kind of do this process. Um, so here's sort of a colorectal cancer screening. So here's the microsystem A, which is really means you know site uh, site. Um, and the blue line is sort of the denominator, and you can kind of read the number of patients on the right side here. Uh, so this is about 225 patients in that clinic, and the, the sort of um, abscissa here is uh, uh, is years, so each of these is kind of the quarter. So you can kind of see this is over about three uh, uh, years, of, about three years of reporting. Um, and so you can see the you know after 2008 when IPC2 started or IPC1 started you can see there's sort of a rapid improvement of colorectal cancer screening and this is true for you know a lot of the measures uh, now it's still not 100 percent there's still a goal that we're reaching you know 70 percent we put that in there um, it should be pretty high for you know the appropriate patient population so the denominator includes sort of the appropriate patient population here and you can see there is sort of you know sustainable change. Uh, and this sort of PDSA cycle actually works for that reasonably long list of measures. Um, and so in some sense, it, this uh, data, and you can see, you know, so here's a, another site which sort of started above the threshold already. And, you know, uh, in, in, in contrast to a sort of nat national benchmarking type of quality improvement where there's sort of just some external paper performance kind of cutoff, because this is sort of internalized local uh, quality improvement PDSA cycles, you can see that it's continuing to improve over time, even when it's past the actual national threshold. Uh, now here, the sort of denominator is 400 patients, but you know it's still a basically a microsystem, um, and uh, so uh, you know this is basically does recapitulate the sort of RAND uh, results and studies uh, that evaluated uh, the chronic care model. Um, it's actually uh, quite difficult for us to, um, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a nice challenge for us to evaluate our success and uh, kind of develop methodologies for evaluation that can inform um, uh, our uh, program design when you have uh, such a moving target as a denominator uh, that's improving all the time and have to evaluate uh, the elements of uh, rapid cycle improvement and sort of nationally aggregate those, uh, you know, with limitations of data sharing, uh, uh, whether you have row-level data or not, that sort of cross-links. So it's actually a lot of interesting, from the informatics point of view, uh, in addition to the HIT point of view, lots of interesting methodological issues here to work with an actively functioning uh, medical home program and kind of really use it in real time to improve care and change of clinical model and uh, point ways to improve your infrastructure. Um, so, and, and so this slide kind of illustrates that idea and I'm just going to try and go through the, I think this is the end of the segments here. So, so the point here is, you know, you really need a lot of data to do this rapid cycle improvement data at the local level that's understandable by clinicians, that gives them a sort of population perspective on their own 400 patients data for the national uh, 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 health system that gives a sort of real time, you know, reasonably real time, not once a year, but quarter by quarter level, um, you know, monitoring as well as goal setting and analytic capability. And um, so data is really the fuel for quality improvement. And those of you who have, you know, actively uh, run either HIT infrastructure for quality or medical directors and have run sort of quality improvement itself, 
you know, this will click with you right away. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's been, um, you know, as a sort of quality informatics uh, type of lead here, you know, it's been great to actually see um, that uh, that message, you know, jumps out at everybody as soon as they sort of really dive in and are part of the program. It just, uh, it's great to sort of see the light bulb going on and, um, you know, but then when the light bulbs do go on, you just sort of really realize how much of a challenge the data, pro or the data, uh, 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 you know, infrastructure and data analytics problem really is. And so that's the other sort of general point to make here about patient-centered medical home is, you know, because this is sort of uh, systems change uh, adopted at all levels of the healthcare system, you actually need analytics and analytic support uh, not only at the enterprise level, not only at the sort of national surveillance level, but also at the point of care level. And, and the informatics and the health IT strategic approaches to enabling um, uniform, uh, heterogeneous data-based uh, analytics in real time as well as uh, to support, uh, you know, close program design, uh, you know, with a sub-year kind of uh, level of improvement. Uh, is really challenging and has not really made it into the sort of strategic perspective of health IT policy just yet. I mean, it may be coming uh, very soon, but um, but that idea that you have this sort of flow of analytics sort of throughout the chain here uh, is really a message that uh, needs to be uh, talked about. So I'm kind of evincing my population health bias again. Um, okay, so let's uh, change gears and. Uh, I don't know if, uh, do we want to stop for questions here or just sort of motor on and then do the discussion uh, in the, after the next uh, bit? Uh, Dr. Bonnie, there's that one question that has come in on a previous slide, and that's what is your current 2011 population size for the uh, American Indian and Alaska Native population? It's about 1.8 million. Okay. It's not over two yet. And of course, it depends on you know we have a lifetime medical record from you know people's birth to their death. So, it, you know, if people move away, they're still active. They can still come to the reservation for care. So, how you measure you know what the actual footprint of the population is is uh, there's no right answer. It's a it's an estimate, a statistical estimate. Um, you know, outside of even the sort of uh, duplicate record kind of level of uh, error bound, just in terms of the real service burden. Um, and then, you know, as uh, uh, programs for financing healthcare and um, access to different uh, state-based and federal uh, 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 programs for healthcare and health service change that Native Americans have access to, uh, you know, we, by a Supreme Court decision, um, actually are a pair of last resort. So actually about half of our resources, although they're, you know, appropriate and come from public sector, are actually transaction based just like any you know healthcare system would they would bill Medicaid and so uh, the relationship between the access to active transaction based programs that you as a Native American can bill because you got registered under Medicaid when you never bothered before or because your clinic kind of you know did that for you this year and they didn't do it for you ten years ago um, uh, all of those uh, uh, events kind of change what and how you use the actual facility and so the you know denominator that is just in the uh, clinical database doesn't necessarily directly convert into the sort of picture of clinical activity. So it's not an easy question to answer. But the bottom line is, um, if if you want to equivalent equilibrate it from that 1.4 million, it's basically gone up to 1.8. Okay, great. Uh, another quick question: what, what are some of the key differences between IHS, IHS hospitals and the tribal hospitals? Um, well, in some sense, not that much because uh, a lot of the uh, changes that took place in the 70s were, uh, you know, based on uh, uh, um, uh, tribes sort of taking ownership of some of the some of the IHS infrastructure. Um, the the main difference, as I would say, is that there is a variation in wealth amongst different tribes depending on their economic activity, um, and so there are some tribes that are sort of um, you know, able to provide really state-of-the-art, beautiful facilities and uh, you know, very substantial specialty care um, that uh, involves some amount of um, 
you know, provision of care that they have uh, uh, kind of uh, delegated or employed from IHS federal staff physicians, you know, being employed in the tribal sector, but then also uh, access to private, either federally qualified health centers, you know, community services, or just, uh, you know, uh, 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 locums or part-time specialty care. And so it really does vary. Um, but your average, you know, out of those 44 hospitals that we have, you know, your average IHS hospital, whether it's tribal or federal, is going to be a five-bed hospital, very much like what you would imagine exists in rural America. And so the easiest way to picture the sort of footprint and the healthcare system at IHS is it's your rural healthcare system equivalent. And uh, so that's sort of the sort of bottom line sort of answer to that question. Great, thanks. I, I think we'll probably hold the rest of the questions till the end of the presentation. Just want to remind all the audience that if you do have questions, do go over to the drop-down box on the right and submit your question there, and then we'll present them to Dr. Advani at the conclusion. And coming up uh, about uh, on the hour, Dr. Advani, for time check. Okay, great. So um, I do have some screenshots, and you know, um, I think these will be uh, 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 quite uh, fast. So. Uh, so the IHS um, uh, medical record system is called uh, the Resource and Patient Management System, uh, which actually is a fork from CPRS. We have our own EHR GUI uh, that's like Vista but different, uh, but the MUMS sort of uh, modules are sort of joined at the hip with uh, the sort of infrastructure and substructure around the VA. So we really do depend on the Veterans Administration system um, and increasingly on, uh, in the future on this integrated EHR. Being developed. Um, uh, so there's a portion of the RPMS system for population health that we call iCare. Uh, you know, we've had health information systems for 40 years. Uh, we've had the sort of population community health focus as part of the health information systems that we've had for 40 years. Uh, but it was around 1984 that we kind of adopted the sort of VA CPRS infrastructure and, and fork from that. Um, and our EHR sort of GUI solution is about five uh, years old or more. And then iCare also started around that time, and that's our population health management uh, application, which is what I'm sort of focusing on here. Um, so this is the old legacy interface, looks a lot like CPRS used to. Uh, and then this is sort of the new one, you know, just looks like a medical record system. Now, you know, we are a small agency. Um, we have a reasonably small IT budget, and we uh, have developed our own EHR um, that's sort of open source. You know, you can kind of FOIA it. We're working on the sort of you know framework of sharing by official open source. We have a number of entities like Hawaii, West Virginia Community Health that have actually adopted uh, RPMS as a medical record system out there outside of the federal government. Um, so it actually does work. Uh, you know, people have reused it. Um, and we have certified this, so uh, and we were the first federal healthcare uh, system and EMR to be certified as both ambulatory and inpatient uh, as of April of this year. So we're on the sort of meaningful use uh, 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 train here uh, in one of the earlier compartments. Um, so what's unique, I think, about RPMS, uh, you know, especially when you compare to the same code base at at, at the VA is. We actually do local clinical repositories. So, uh, you know, this is still MUMPS based, it's still hierarchical file systems, hierarchical databases like MUMPS is. Uh, but we have uh, sort of redundant local analytical repositories at each site. And that's called the patient care component. So we take our encounters uh, and our patients and we use that information to create uh, files in the patient care component. And then we run a ton of analytics on top of that. Um, uh, and so uh, the uh, population health applications kind of, you know, from care management for women's health or immunizations or our um, public health applications kind of run from that. Um, and so uh, I've kind of done this. So I'm going to basically talk about a couple of elements of this uh, today in terms of the demonstration quality improvement care management. You know, I've exercised on epidemiology and stuff, but I won't, we won't talk about all our um, uh, other uh, population health work here. So the, the main components of population health applications in RPMS that I'll describe are sort of the components of eye care, some of the functionality. There's a lot more that I won't have time to go into. And um, you know, we actually just Google it. We've done you know various presentations. You can always find out more. And we're very happy to 
know, uh, give uh, demonstrations to organizations uh, uh, from our care team here. Um, we'll talk a little bit about clinical reporting, uh, and I won't actually go into our H1N1 and epidemiology surveillance or our uh, workflow-based uh, sort of proto-deficient report um, immunizations or clinical repository compared to effectiveness work. Um, so here's eye care. It's sort of part of the GUI uh, for RPMS. It's sort of a separate trigger to start it, but it's totally linked. Um, and the idea of eye care is to link the information from individual records while you're in the clinic to community information, to panel information about populations of patients that either directly apply to you, that apply to your quality improvement activities, that apply to your public health activities, that apply to the analytic uh, uh, inputs to uh, decision support and to denominators. So this is sort of what it looks like. Um, uh, it's, uh, I sort of mentioned this already. Uh, um, so it's an interesting, unique model. You know, um, on the ground, daily, uh, uh, daily incorporation of panel-based uh, reasoning and population health as part of the bread and butter part of the health system you know, I, I just I have not seen that in the private sector as much, and maybe now because of accountable care in medical homes, all of that will start happening. Um, I know, for instance, uh, you know, at Geisinger and a lot of the sort of um, uh, HIT applications like eye care, you know, for local quality reporting and tracking, those have been developed and actually mostly on the top of your cost kind of EHR product. Um, but in terms of sort of a true integration in practice, um, uh, this is still somewhat unique. I mean, maybe in five years, you know, the word will get out. But um, so how does this relate? At, so it's sort of, you know, built on top of the sort of local repository connected to the uh, EHR. Um, and then now, so the elements of the patient center medical home and, uh, you know, how that sort of maps on to eye care. Um, so, just to review, and I'm sure you all have sort of thought about this deeply uh, for a few years at least. Um, these are sort of, I think this is the ASIP uh, set of principles that were adopted um, for Pain Center Medical Home, uh, probably by this organization itself, right? So enhance access and continuity, identify and manage patient populations, plan and manage care, provide self-care support and community resources, track and coordinate care, measure and improve performance. So a lot of these principles are sort of very directly sort of uh, implemented uh, in multiple ways and are, you know, really already naturally part of the healthcare practice and HIT system for the sort of reasons I've outlined before. Today, I think uh, I've got a couple of slides that sort of illustrate our measure and improve performance improvement and then the track and coordinate care sort of panel definition kind of functionality. So. I think we're about to go into more sort of specific screenshots, but that's sort of, you know, there's sort of other applications that would apply to registries and things. Uh, community health representatives, uh, you know, non-traditional determinants of care, uh, kind of data flows, risk factors, all of those things are behavioral health. These are all sort of parts of our HIV infrastructure. Um, okay, so, oh wow, okay. So uh, this is from the National Priorities Partnership. Um, and it just sort of shows you a framework for performance measurement. So before we sort of focus down on elements of functionality for quality reporting, you know, here's another uh, um, uh, justification for the connection between daily clinical care and this idea of population management. Um, now the idea of risk adjustment, risk adjusted health measures and the connection between perceptions of quality reporting at the national level and the sort of case-specific reasoning that physicians uh, kind of or clinicians practice for an individual patient, that's the other side of that, uh, you know, full circle. And that itself actually getting that message across for a different purpose as a different policy imperative at the federal level is also sort of work to be done. And that so it does come out actually when you're building HIT systems and trying to design kind of what is the message about the national uh, you know health measures or even the IPC measures that are sort of part of the measurement and part of the evaluation as part of your PDSA cycle. You know if you have a different case mix in your microsystem with your 400 patients, you're going to see completely different numbers, and you're going to be acting with uh, you know diagnoses and treatments that 
may not map to the full goal. And so um, it's sort of like no child left behind issues when everybody tries to go for 100%, it's just not going to work. Uh, the case mix adjustment has sort of similar issues in healthcare. Um, okay, so let's see here. There's some arrows. So we have a number of different uh, quality measure uh, reporting uh, uh, programs that we need to service as a federal entity, as a sort of clinical delivery entity, as a regulatory entity, and for our own internal uh, purposes. Uh, and so, you know, there's accountable care organization measures, there's MU measures, there's measures for value-based purchasing, our uh, government performance reporting measures that are clinical oriented, our PERSA, community health, UDS measures, and then these IPC measures uh, as part of our quality improvement program. There's actually a number of other uh, systems. So we have to kind of support all of those. There's separate appropriated programs in diabetes and um, cardiovascular disease, HIV uh, care that are all sort of part of our quality measurement framework. Um, and so uh, we have eye care, which uh, is sort of local level analytics. Uh, and now we could sort of expand this to national views uh, in your traditional enterprise or uh, system-wide business intelligence framework. We have a separate sort of uh, data warehousing uh, clinical repository evolution effort there. Um, but, but this level, this sort of analytics at the sort of local microsystem, which actually I you know, really like uh, as a formulation, because it's not just point of care for individual doctors. It's really clinic level, clinical director level management, and it's not the same as pay for performance and accountable care with sort of tremendous financial uh, uh, implications um, that are measurable, but is really at the level of clinical com you know, coordinated decision making for your population of patients where you affect the care and you need that perspective in organized medicine. Um, that's the level at which uh, we actually report locally on national measures. Um, and so that's sort of an incredibly important tool uh, to track. And you can see there's sort of a number of different um, uh, uh, panes here of uh, uh, functionality uh, that you know, we don't have time to go to. Uh, there's decision support. There's inferences based on intermediate concept uh, uh, inference called diagnostic tags. A lot of these are sort of pre-compiled in different patches, so we don't necessarily have a sort of on-the-fly kind of uh, concept definition functionality in a lot of places, but it really is um, because it's an active HIT program that's closely related to a practicing uh, clinical service agency, we can do you know, quarterly patches where we actually have on the ground implementation of clinical policy and we can do it inexpensively because we don't have to design it uh, in a sort of vendor customer relationship. We're doing in-house development. And, that's a huge, huge point as well. I mean, the whole uh, conception of, you know, stage two and stage three for vendors um, really begs the question of who's going to take on the responsibility for knowledge management and knowledge creation around uh, the clinical semantics of this decision support. And it's a big hole in the business model of uh, out in the marketplace, um, you know to be able to charge per transaction and, and amortize the cost of maintaining a decision rule, very few vendors, because you know the clinicians need to actually own that. And the clinicians don't have an in-house relationship. Unless you're a very, very big vendor with a sort of software as a service model, uh, it's hard to actually absorb that uh, and maintain it over time. Plus, all of medicine is just too huge. So luckily, you know, we actually, this is, I mean, I our Office of Information Technology reports to our chief medical officer just like the Office of Clinical and Preventive Services and the Office of Public Health Support. So we actually have a fulcrum from which we can uh, take the benefit of um, you know, help from clinicians and have measure stewards within the healthcare system who really own the definitions of these things. And we can, you know, at every quarterly release of our uh, population health applications, uh, get their input and then absorb the, uh, and those measure stewards are the leads for you know that improvement area. So it's a very nice close collaboration that I think is also another unique part, but it sort of points the way of you know what's really necessary and the kinds of organizational initiatives that you know maybe PCPCC would have to adopt as this sort of entity that brings you know, healthcare vendors, self-insured risk bearers, and the clinical community together to kind of really develop that model for how you roll this out because it's not really solved as a sort of business model issue out in the private sector. That's just sort of quantificating a little bit. 
uh, the main point here is you can drill down from that population view right in the medical record right there. Um, and so and that's huge as well because actually uh, because there's some sort of a clinical repository that's actually a direct reflection from the mumps article database, this is actually really hard to do in relational uh, analytic uh, you know feed nightly from um, medical record systems uh, in the sort of traditional local decision support model. So uh, in a way, because we take shortcuts because you know we don't have as much capital uh, available for developing systems, we allow ourselves interoperability in ways that a uh, traditional vendor-based system may not. Uh, although you know you can do from last night what the drill down would be for that patient. Um, okay, so track and coordinate care. So another five minutes and then I'll be done for questions. Um, so the important functionality here is you know this is to support the medical home. So we have an incredibly robust a uh, uh, method to define panels of patients that can then be fed into, you know, we're developing actually group orders uh, to do screening orders all at one time with one button for the whole panel. Uh, you know, the proto, proto decision support with workflows and communication reminders for all of these. Um, uh, reporting capabilities, exporting capabilities, graphing capabilities, uh, but most importantly, kind of taking ownership as a microsystem team for a set of patients where there's a many-to-many -many relationship and having the HIT population health application kind of manage that relationship in real time without interrupting the workflow of uh, your EMR with your individual you know, lab results and uh, note-taking update. Um, that is uh, uh, you know, amazing functionality. I'm, I'm just amazed that our team actually is able to do this you know, over the last year, um, but it's um, it's being very well received by the actual uh, care teams involved in the medical home implementation. Um, and, you know, there's various diff ways to define. You can do sort of raw queries. You can kind of filter on uh, on criteria. You can filter on sort of uh, patient demographics. All of the above by provider participation, by class of patient designated provider impanel, formal impanelment. All of that here is possible. Uh, you can do pre-canned. Uh, panel definitions are sort of more ad hoc versions and then just sort of more limitations of the ad hoc version. Um, so you get the patient level detail, uh, you get core measures sort of across the top here for those. Uh, there's sort of provider level detail. So, you know, because this is a hierarchical database, there's no on the fly data cube kind of thing. It's sort of pre canned, but it's in a sense, you know, the good thing is because of the, we have to do it pre canned, we have to constantly communicate about workflows that the care team really need and match our HIT, you know, wizard-based functionality here, menu functionality, right to the sort of 80-20 very fast requirements that the care team need. And as a result, the physicians actually use this individually. So it's not, you know, your decision support analyst in the back office. It's sort of at the point of care. Um, so we just sort of play to our strength a little bit. Um, uh, again, provider aggregation for quality measures, et cetera. You don't have to sort of, and then facility level aggregation for some of the resources. And then this all gets exported to a web portal. Okay, so just in conclusion then, um, uh, um, so this sort of the, you know, seven or eight HIT drivers and functions for the patient center medical home. And I'm actually uh, looking forward to awaiting the sort of work that uh, the PCPCC did in consultation with ARC on the sort of fuller, sort of more comprehensive list of, of this uh, these elements uh, hopefully will come out soon. But, um, uh, you know, clinical decision support registries, team care, care transitions, personal health records. I didn't show you our blue button personal health records. I haven't shown you our telehealth and measurement performance reporting. So actually, we actually do have a lot of these elements already uh, in play at IHS. Um, so what's our sort of in conclusion, our experience, and just to sort of drive home the main points here of the four questions. Uh, I talked about the long-standing drivers in the care model for over 40 years and how that we have seen at IHS in our experience and how they're now affecting the general healthcare system. We, we talked about community as the patients, uh, meaning uh, that population health IT is integral to daily work. We talked about the close collaboration both in terms of our HIT development process as well as sort of programmatically just in terms of our program goals between clinical and national programs for HIT. Uh, and in a sense, this is the sort of PDSA model for HIT itself. So it's sort of um, kind of using that philosophy of 
uh, PDSA quick rapid innovative cycles for quality improvement and the idea of agile development and HIT and they're really the same they're same they're the same process you know and somebody who's uh, interested in quality informatics would sort of see that connection um, and then lastly you know evaluation and data-based medicine uh, really is an important program is an important element of not only quality improvement but all HIT deployment. So uh, before I end, just wanted to uh, acknowledge um, our national RPMS program team. You know, multiple people, our national eye care population health team, our national IPC program team, our uh, health and human service collaborators, uh, including the VA, CPR, and most importantly, all the uh, incredibly committed uh, missionary to the hardworking. IHS innovators uh, throughout the years. Uh, this is really, you know, built on the shoulders of their work. All right. Great, thank you, Dr. Vani. Uh, we have a, several questions that have come in during the talk, and I also wanted to remind the audience if you do have additional questions, to go to the drop-down box on the right side panel and enter your questions there, and then we'll present them to Dr. Vani. Uh, first question is, is there a mandate to implement patient-centered medical home across the travel systems in the same way that you at IHS are driving the model? Uh, it's not a mandate, of course, because the tribes really own uh, their components. But in general, uh, for on-the-ground system-level improvement, the tribes generally participate wholeheartedly. Um, so it definitely includes the tribal sector uh, on all of our efforts. I don't know what you're looking at. Uh, but uh, is there maybe somebody who needs to mute uh, their line? Um, we're hearing some crosstalk. But in any case, uh, the short answer is uh, there's no mandate, but d definitely most of the tribes are participating. Great. Thank you. Uh, what is the database technology for the uh, questioner asked PCC database? I wonder if they mean IPC database. But so it's MUMPS. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's just another file system in the hierarchical uh, database of MUMPS. Okay. Relational database system? Or no, it's a hierarchical database, so hierarchy. it's not relational. It's rooted on, it's got two files rooted on visits and encounters and one rooted on patients. And you sort of rifle through those IDs as a root in order to get it in the information. Um, there is some caching which could be, you know, with more modern technology, but that's, that's mostly for the purposes of runtime caching not uh, to replace the PCC actual clinical repository at the local level. So there is some sort of relational level, but mostly object uh, object relational sort of Java based, you know, uh, caching kind of techniques, but uh, that's not sort of the primary actual data model for the true local repository. Great, thank you. Is your eye care system complete or are you continuing to add new capabilities for we're continuing to, so for instance, I mean, uh, and you know, and we're very happy to collaborate. This is sort of government, you know, public sector work, uh, so the public owns it. But, um, you know, the, the, the full service rollout of true active decision support, uh, which can reason fully uh, for full guideline-based care, isn't done yet. We've started with workflows that are in communication. The idea of, I mean, the future stuff, we're starting. We're starting with group orders, the decision support and the, Understanding how much is necessary of inference at the local level to, to validate a group order for ordering screening for 100 patients, tracking you know with one button. So basically managing the population truly as a patient with analytics in an interventional way uh, using HIT is all work to be done. Uh, cross mapping uh, real time transactional versus uh, you know health exchange standards compatible C32s into the conceptual subcomponents of reasoning and reporting on population health, uh, quality measurements, cross-mapping the semantics between quality measurements, updating all of this for ICD-10, um, you know, uh, coming up with a uh, common data model across quality measurements federally. These are all, uh, you know, and then actually uh, uh, elevating the CRS uh, user interface analytic capability to have a true um, uh, data model specification that is independent of the MUMPS RPMS code base and repository so we can kind of apply it to our COTS uh, partners at some of the tribes. Those are all things that we need to continue to work on. Great, thank you. Um, is the Indian Health Service connecting to health information exchanges? And if so, is clinical data from 
health information exchange is slated to be incorporated into your core measurement data? Yes, it is, uh, and thank you for that question. So we are the sort of um, you know uh, prime internal federal entity that implements everything that ONC comes out with, really. Uh, so we have, and because we're actually a national health system with, you know, we're a system of systems, and so all of the policies that are national level policies, we can actually, you know, they actually legitimately apply to us, and, and, and we sincerely try and implement them. So we do have a HIE between, um, you know, for, for instance, for the use case of a tribal member going from one, uh, and one clinical installation you know, probably not across tribes, but to an urban program or between two locations that are, have independent um, uh, uh, EHRs. We have a master patient index uh, implementation that would sort of connect IDs across tribes, and we do have a C32 CCT based uh, health summary. We are create, creating a national clinical repository based on health exchange summary level data, and we're doing a quality measurement use case on that. So that's actually kind of a first. Um, it's sort of similar to the Query Health kind of initiative that, that's coming out to actually validate whether that use case would work. I mean, you know, the Q105, the C105 uh, work kind of is in pause mode for the quality reporting data specification that came out of HIPP for a couple of years now. So, uh, you know, we're busy kind of implementing the whole HIE philosophy. Great, thanks. What strategies or specific tactics are being contemplated or implemented to engage patients directly with the care teams and the eye care population health platform? Uh, can you repeat that again? Yeah, what, what strategies or tactics are you contemplating or implementing to directly engage patients with your care teams and the eye care population health platform? So I think the key uh, for uh, question there is how to engage patients in this sort of uh, three-legged uh, relationship. Uh, that's a great question. Um, uh, you know, the sort of patient perspective on the medical home improvement, it's, it's really a core part of our mission and our goal for why we've created this program. The uh, methodological and program design elements to truly improve the patient experience through the sort of, you know, internal provider system change churn and the HIT healthcare infrastructure churn that you've seen on all these slides, um, you know, I have not really outlined, um, but uh, for but you know, like, and I didn't really include those in my backup slides, so I apologize. But um, uh, but apart from the fact that you know that your data sort of as a patient just does get into the system, and so somebody's doing some good things with it, um, uh, we do have sort of specific outcomes, and I, you know, if I rifled back through those. To, to one element of that measurement, there is sort of patient-centered measurement around wait times and sort of things that directly affect patient access and the patient experience. And so that there was actually sort of four uh, uh, quality measures that I showed you in that IPC measurement. And so those are sort of the very direct patient-centered kind of goals. And maybe I didn't sort of read down low enough on that slide to emphasize that point. So, uh, so we do have that. But you know, that sort of how you sort of uh, kind of really um, uh, translate that into on the ground systems change with the patient really front and center outside of the fact that there's sort of common information flows like you know in the patient center medical home health IT infrastructure point of view which you know sort of self-evident for all of us here um, you know it's, it's it's a great question and there's still lots of work to be done great well, thank you I uh, hope Dr. Advani, on behalf of both the PCC Center for Public Payer Implementation and the Center for eHealth, I'd like to thank you very much for your very interesting and informative view of the complexities and challenges of population health manage management in one of our national health care systems. Uh, it's very well appreciated and received, and uh, also like to thank our audience who's been in attendance through the hour and a half of the presentation. and. Uh, You've uh, got, a, got a great job uh, ahead, and uh, really want to thank you for taking the time to be with us today. It was my pleasure, and you know we're always open to talk to anyone uh, who contacts us, so please uh, don't hesitate. Great. Would you uh, like to make your email address available publicly for uh, further yeah, questions, actually, or how would you like so to it's email So it's anil.advani at ihs.gov, and you probably get that from Google, but um, uh, you're welcome to sort of distribute that. Okay, great, thank you. And would like to put in a final plug for the uh, October 21st uh, BCPCC Summit in Washington, D.C. You can register online. And uh, 
pay now or pay more later, I guess, or <laughs> the watchword on that. But uh, hopefully you'll be able to join us in October for what appears to be another great session with your peers. So uh, at this point, I'd like to close the session, and uh, thank you all for being in attendance.